Welcome everyone, great to have you all literally from all over the world for another update, the AMA update, which we do monthly. And here we have uh, probably the 20th or more session that we're going to be enjoying some uh, from Jason Hill. We have people connecting literally from all over the world, South Africa, Slovenia, Kenya, uh, and uh, US and Australia and Lionel Man and so many countries. This is the community of the Hill worldwide. Misha, what's the program for today? Yeah, amazing community, Ruben. And we've got another big update for you guys tonight. Lots going on over the last little while. Um, Jason's got a, a jam-packed session for you guys. So uh, make sure you guys buckle up, uh, buckle up your seatbelts because it's going to be lot to, lots to see and lots of details. Um, so as usual, Jason's going to be updating us for about 45 minutes or so. And then we're going to transition to the Q&A session. So we call it an AMA because it's an Ask Me Anything session. So anything can go. Um, all of your questions can go in the chat. So there's a, a live chat for you guys to all use for those questions. So throughout this session, while you guys are thinking of the questions that you'd like to ask, make sure you post those in that in that chat session section there. And then we're going to be taking those questions and presenting them to, to Jason at the end. He's going to be able to answer all of those questions for us. Uh, we're going to leave basically uh, nothing unanswered, uh, about a, an hour session of, of Q&A at the end. So um, looking forward to it, Jason. And thank you again for taking your, your time. I know you're very busy. Uh, to be able to update everybody that uh, is in this community about where you are with the build of the, uh, the HX50. So we're going to pass it over to you now. Thanks. Thanks, Ruben. Thanks, Misha. And uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the July AMA. Uh, in tonight's update, I'm going to be giving you an update on where we are with the, the airframe, uh, the GT50 engine program. Uh, I'm going to give you a live production update from around DC1 here so you can see what's going on right now at the development center. We're going to talk about the avionics and the electrical system development. And then I'll talk about the, uh, the factory development and our approval, pr uh, approval programs, both for uh, HC and HX. So let's start with the, the airframe. What we're doing at DC1 at the moment is essentially taking our airframe technology from prototype through to being production ready. Airframe 5 that sat behind me demonstrated fundamental capability. It shows that the concept of the design, the weight budget and the cost targets are all viable for delivering all of the performance gains that a monolithic carbon structure delivers for an aircraft of this size and weight. What we've got to do now, or what we're doing now, is capturing all of the process knowledge, capturing all of the process learnings from going through the process of designing, building patterns, molds, and then airframe parts, and building that back into the design so that we've got something that is as efficient to produce in a reliable and repeatable way as we possibly can. The goal, of course, is we need to make every single one of these aircraft perfect every time. So the first part of that process is essentially validating what we've done in creating Airframe 5. So the first part of doing that is to go and carry out a geometric survey of each and every piece of the process. So we started with patterns, we also surveyed the moulds, and we also surveyed the whole 3D fuselage using 3D laser technology. Now the reason for this is that the geometry, the surface finish, and potentially any defects transfer from the patterns to the molds to the parts. So in understanding exactly where we are in the development of this process, we needed to evaluate that and then trace down any of the, the issues we might need to, uh, uh, need to resolve. So we quantify the problem, we quantify where we are with, qualify, uh, with quality, and then we identify any improvements we can make. And what we've done is we've essentially validated the entire airframe manufacturing process that we've taken. For us, it's vital that we can use low cost patterns, uh, pattern techniques that have been abstracted from the, the boat building industry, and then out of autoclave room temperature chlor uh, curing infusion processes to be able to make the patterns to give us this low cost, high volume composite manufacturing uh, capability that delivers the quality that we need for an aerospace application. Now, what we found with the geometric survey is that by and large, the, the patterns, the molds and the parts themselves were incredibly accurate, really, really tightly tolerant throughout. There were a couple of areas of uh, def uh, broad deformation that were very quickly attributed to uh, some deformations in the patterns that I'll show you now. So fundamentally, 
all of composite manufacture, all of composite manufacturing starts with pattern production. And it's vital that we can create accurate geometry, accurate surface finish, because all of that's going to be passed on. So when we develop our patterns, you'll, have, you'll recall from previous updates that we start with a low cost foam uh, volume. We fiberglass over the top. And as you can see on the slide, we then add a tooling paste that becomes the layer that we machine back and finish down to the final surface. Now, what we found is as the fiberglass and the tooling paste cures, it's actually able to subtly deform the overall pattern. And so what we've been doing over the course of the, the last few weeks is developing strategies to manage that deformation so that we can achieve really really tight tolerances irrespective of the shape of the pattern that we need to make. So we've developed a, a methodology for clamping the patterns correctly in every stage of the, the, uh, the, de the development process uh, and making sure that the temperature controls are adequately uh, developed to hit all of these tolerances. So the other thing that's vital if you're going to use, infu uh, use infused tools is that you must hold vacuum integrity. And again, over the course of the, the last month or so, we've carried out, out a complete vacuum audit, audit on our entire inventory of patterns and demonstrated both in-house and then with an external uh, verification that we are now achieving robust vacuum integrity. That now means that we can produce absolutely perfect infused moulds at the right for the right quality and at the right price point the other thing that we've been carrying out is mapping out the tightness of the controls that are necessary for the um, uh, for the curing process how tightly we have to main, maintain the temperatures to hit these tolerances and again for that we took some of our existing patterns and put them in a temperature controlled environment put them through a ramp rate and then measured the deformations. And again, that has now all been locked down into the process controls that we're using to produce the actual flying prototype airframes. In a similar vein, we've also done a very, very similar process for the uh, infused moulds that form the outer moulds to make the fuselage and also the, the tail boom. These are vital to the workflow because in production, in order to hit the run rates that we need, we need multiple sets of tools. So it's essential that the tools are repeatable, are repeatable to produce and also have the vacuum integrity that are required. One of the, the details that the 3D scans revealed was that the initial set of prototype patterns had got a slight run out between the the roof pattern and the walls that washed out some of the recesses that were required to make sure the roof cowlings remained flush with the body during production and so we've subsequently gone back and modified that to make sure that we capture every last little detail that's necessary to make the external aerodynamic surface of HX50 as clean and as crisp as possible. So we're now uh, at a position where we've got geometrically accurate moulds uh, and we're also in a, process, in a position now where we've demonstrated that from our patterns we can produce high integrity infused, uh, infused vacuum type moulds. This now gives us end-to-end -end control of our composite production process. So everything that we need to do to deliver these things in volume we can now control so when you bring all of this together, what this essentially means is we now have the recipe to be able to scale this up to production. We've been developing these, proto these uh, prototype airframes in parallel with the development of the, uh, the airframe detailed design and approval exercises. So we have the opportunity to bake some of these things in before the patterns become locked down for prototype flying and also for uh, uh, for certification and production. We're now in a position to bring all of those things in, lock it down, and we have our essentially the recipe for our finished uh, production process. This includes uh, the work that's going on to optimize the design features for production, to optimize the tools themselves, and importantly, to reduce the labor that's required to make each and, uh, each and every one of these, uh, these airframes. And then one of the other things we'll show you a little bit later is some of the work that we've been doing to 
automate the production of these fuselages because as you've seen at the moment both the kit cutting uh, a lot of the trimming uh, and the inspection is all incredibly manual we've been working with a variety of robot producers and our in-house NDT specialist to be able to optimize all of these processes so that we can automate as much of it again to allow us to scale up to volume production as quickly as possible Let's just quickly go and have a look at the uh, patterns and moulds that we've got on the shop floor for you over here. Let's come with me, Josh. So what we've got here is essentially one of the tail boom uh, patterns. So this is where everything starts. This is the basis of your geometry. It's the basis of your surface finish and it's the basis of the vacuum integrity. When we developed these patterns, the whole point of these was to build in all, build in all of the learning from making the airframes to ensure that this surface was vacuum tight and we were delivering the finishes that we need to be transferred to the moulds and then onto the parts. We've now proven that this has been completed successfully. This pattern here has just come back from a, a trial where we've taken really, really high quality molds off it. And we've subsequently also developed a, a new finishing technique to be able to further enhance the surface finish that we can get off these patterns, both in terms of our in-house gantry mill machining capability and also a, a, a coating and hand finishing final stage to the process. So everything starts with the patterns. This is all now locked down and essentially ready to be reproduced for the different patterns and molds we need to make for the production tool sets. What we've got down here is essentially the carbon fiber tool that gets taken from this mold. So we have the male form here. We have the opposite hand or the female form here. You'll notice the tools are made out of carbon fiber and that's because when we, in, when we uh, manufacture the tail boom parts itself, it requires an elevated temperature cure. And to do that, you have to make carbon parts in carbon tools because one of the characteristics of carbon fiber is it has an extremely low expansion, uh, thermal uh, expansion coefficient. So if you, if you don't make carbon parts and carbon tools, you get a big mismatch between your tooling and your part that causes you all sorts of problems. These were one of the, uh, the first tools that we produced before we nailed the vacuum integrity on the, the, uh, the parts. And what you can see here, that in certain areas, there's areas where we're slightly dry, there's areas where the surface finish isn't perfect, and there's areas where the infusion strategy hasn't been quite right. And those areas would mean that these, these uh, molds were, were rejects. Over the course of the, the last three or four weeks, we've been doing an awful lot of development work to move this process on so that we can reliably infuse these patterns and molds. Now, in order to do that, we actually made a, uh, a further test pattern here of the same, a test mold here of the same pattern, but this time, rather than using carbon cloth, we've used exactly the same uh, cloth topology, but in glass. And the reason for that is glass is of course clear. We can see through it, so it makes it very, very easy to inspect and verify that the infusion process has worked properly. Now using this process and using uh, a slightly improved infusion strategy, we've now been able to repeatably produce infu infused uh, high integrity, high quality molds at room temperature, which give us the ability to reproduce these things quickly and inexpensively and scale up for, for production. So really, really pleased with the work that Dave uh, and Tim have been doing at, uh, at DC, uh, DC2 and down at Saltash. This has really drawn a, a period of about 12 months worth of work to a close and sets us up really nicely for putting these things into production. So well done guys, really pleased with what we've done here. Let's go and have a look at uh, glazing for a second. Okay, so that covers the, uh, the carbon structure and what we're doing to deliver the, uh, the airframe into production. Of course, HX50 has a vast area of uh, transparency in the roof, in the chin, along the sides, and of course, the polycarbonate crashworthy windshields and, and chin windows. Now, 
we've, you've been, you will have been tracking how we've been developing these processes in-house for a little while, the forming processes, uh, the trimming processes that you can see on the slide at the moment, and then also the optical quality of the panels that we produce. Now, in the early trials, what we found was that the, uh, the forming process was great. We can happily form these things inexpensively into the, to the right quality, the right accuracy, but we, we, we hadn't quite got the tooling strategy right for producing these sorts of parts to the levels of optical quality that we needed. And that was entirely traceable back to an inadequate surface finish on the tooling. When we're doing prototyping like this and when the design is still subject to change, it's important that we don't tie up vast amounts of, of money in tools that you're gonna subsequently throw away or have to modify. So we'd been using a relatively simple, low cost type of tooling to produce these initial window uh, components, but that in turn was then causing us problems in terms of the optical quality that we were getting from the windows we formed. Over the course of the, the last three or four weeks, we've been developing an enhanced method of surface finishing the prototype tools to enable us to produce all of the transparencies that surround uh, the airframe with the right level of optical quality. And as of this morning, Mark's just got back from one of our test houses uh, down in High Wycombe to verify that the tooling process that we're now using is producing optically uh, perfect, to, uh, optically perfect mold. So let's go and have a quick look at some of the test panels that we've been producing over here. So what we've got here, this is actually the, the window, uh, the, the form tool for the glazing on the window on the co-pilot's front door. As you can see, they're, they're vast, vast tools. In production, you would generally make these tools out of aluminium, but they become very, very expensive to, to throw away or to modify as the, the design evolves during development. So from this pattern, uh, we took this formed panel here. So that sits over the, the top like so. Um, it's slightly oversized for this particular part. It's still got its back coating on. When we inspected these early patterns, we found that there was a range of optical witness marks where you could see the individual joins in these blocks, despite the fact they've been CNC'd to very, very tight to tolerances and hand finish, you could still, still see them. So what we've had to do is improve the finishing process for the tool. So this is the, the, the rear part of the wraparound section of the, uh, the windshield. And what we've done here is we've applied the same sort of mirror finishing process uh, uh, to the top of this tool so this has had a layer of paste some hand finishing and then a, a top coat and polish we've applied the same finishing process to this that we're now applying to all of the patterns that make the composite parts so that when the composite parts come out they're essentially immediately ready for paint and what you can find here is that the optical quality of these parts is now really, really good. All of the witness lines have gone. The only minor defects that you can see in this panel uh, are simply because um, the, uh, the environment where this was formed wasn't quite up to uh, clean room standards, which it needs to be to form optical panels. Now, as you're aware, the design intent is that, uh, oh, I'll just show you. If you're not familiar how this forming process works, this, this, this uh, material starts life as a flat sheet and it's then drawn down over, over the mould and the vacuum. That forms, conforms to the top surface of the mould and then we pop it off and then the five axis CNC machine down the road just comes round and cuts out the actual bit that we want to stick to the side of the airframe. Now, as you're aware, all of the side windows and the roof windows are acrylic. And the reason for that is you want to be able to kick through those in the event of a rollover or some, some form of mishap. You can't use acrylic on the front windows because it doesn't have sufficient uh, impact resilience. And for that, we need to use polycarbonate. Now, polycarbonate is a much more difficult material to form. Uh, this is a, a this, the, uh, this is a part that we also made today off the same tool, but using a different forming process. This was drape formed rather than vacuum formed. And what we've shown with this is that sadly, there's no escaping the heated aluminium tools for, for this. We're gonna need to, to go the full hog to get the optical quality right for these, these parts for the, uh, the flying uh, prototype. So um, we're just gonna have to bite the bullet on that one, I'm afraid. But what this does show is in terms of forming it, we're spot on. We just need a slightly better tool finish and a heated tool to be able to get the uh, optical quality to where it needs to be, particularly for that front, uh, front windshield. 
Let's go back. Okay. So in, a, in addition to the work on the, the patterns, the molds, we've also, of course, been making more parts. So uh, last uh, session, we introduced the very first tail boom section that we built for, for HX50. Um, this section, as I said at the time, had been built in pieces as we released the, the molds uh, from, from manufacture. What Dave and the team down at DC2 are doing at the moment is building the very first structurally representative tail boom. So this isn't quite the finished laminate detail, Tail, but it's made in the way that we will make the finished tail boom. So this is this it essentially captures all of our production intent, proves that we can make the tail boom the way we need to make it, and gives us all of the feedback that we need to to be able to finalise that detail and get that into uh, production. So in this case, the finished uh, tail boom is produced in two halves and then has a, a bonded joint to make the laminate much more easy to execute and much more production friendly. Um, the tooling strategy for that has now been validated. We've made those tools. Those are down at DC2 at the moment. Uh, the laminating approach for laminating the, the tool in the way we need and getting the metallic inserts has been uh, validated. And again, we've now validated the fact that we can deliver these things to weight, to cost, and the overall appro approach for producing the second half of the, uh, the structure. So really pleased with, uh, with how that's coming together. We introduced in the last session the, that we'd used Airframe 4, which is sat just behind me over there, just in front of me over there, as a human factors uh, uh, demonstrator. And during the, the course of the last month or so, we've been carrying out a range of tests using the, uh, the, uh, the human factors rig, just a sanity check every element of the flying experience uh, that HX50 offers because it's not only important that HX50 delivers on uh, performance parameters and fit and finish, it also has to feel right as a, as a helicopter. We've had a number of opportunities emerge as we've done the structural design to slim down some of the A and, P, A and B pillar beams, slim down some of the beams in the, the roof uh, that we've now been able to encapsulate into the, uh, into the fuselage itself. We've also been able to significantly increase the, uh, the upward view angle by breathing the, the brow line up a little bit. And all of these things are afforded to us because uh, we're vertically integrated, because we can do both of these things in parallel. So one of the things that the guys have been doing down at DC2 is just verifying the best way to take advantage of some of the, the work that's come out of the structural design exercise to make the overall flying experience uh, as powerful as we, we want it to be. So really pleased with how all of that's, uh, that's coming on as well. Let's talk about the, uh, the drivetrain and the, the engine for a little while. So one of the, the key uh, exercises that's going on at the moment as Mark's readying himself uh, and well in fact producing a lot of the prototype components for the first engine is doing some of the long lifing exercises and very uh, uh, validating all of the tiny details within some of the components that will be the last to be released uh, to production. So it's really important with something like a gas turbine that you get the detailed design right because if these, if these details aren't right it's not not just that the engine doesn't work very well it won't work at all and so over the course of the last few weeks we've been doing a lot of work uh, in essentially uh, validating the detailed design of the secondary air system, sealing strategies and um, all of these sorts of things. On top of that, Mark has been extremely busy manufacturing the first of the production components to demonstrate the capability here in DC1. So a lot of the sophisticated manufacturing processes that we need for manufacturing impellers, manufacturing the bearings, the gears, the turbine blades have been going on over the course of the, the last few weeks as we wait, wait for a few more of the components to be release for, for production. So if we talk first about the, the latest round of design refinement that's been carried out on the, the engine, essentially every little detail counts of this engine. Uh, it's, not, it's not the big picture that you see on the outside, it's the myriad of tiny little things inside that make the difference between this working or not. Um, Pavel and his team have been doing extensive work on the aerothermal optimization of the engine, making sure we've got packing air where we need it, making sure that the labyrinth seals work exactly how we need them, 
which then sets the temperature distribution in the engine, which then essentially uh, sets the life of the, the engine. This involves extremely complicated structural analysis, thermal analysis, aerodynamic analysis, and whole engine modeling, which the guys have been executing brilliantly. Um, what comes out of this essentially is the detailed uh, refinement and lockdown of the internal cooling systems in the engine and how we hold on to oil in all of the tiny little cavities where we need to keep key components well lubricated. The other thing that's been happening over the course of the last few weeks is the detailed stress and dynamic design of the final few rotating components. So optimizing the strength of some of the critical rotating components, managing the containment issues you'll be aware and I'll demonstrate shortly that we moved from a blisk over to a bladed disc a little while ago and that changes the way we have to manage the failure mode sequence and how we have to manage the containment of these components in the event of a, of a failure and so the guys have been doing extensive strength optimization on the fur, fur trees on the blade roots and then on the bits of the engine that have to contain those things in the event of a blade failing uh, the other thing that we've had to spend uh, a lot of time on as well is the management of natural frequencies. So there's lots of rotating components, there's lots of shed wakes and shed vorticity within these engines and we have to make sure that we don't tickle natural frequencies of blades and veins and casings that could then lead to a premature vibration failure. It's all of that detailed work that can only happen when the design is sufficiently mature and it's been through production verification so that you get to an engine that's both manufacturable and viable and delivers broadly what you expect on the test bench. So one of the things that uh, we've been asked over the, the course of the, the last month that I thought I'd just speak to today is uh, the benefits or, or uh, as such of moving to bladed discs, why this is a good idea or why we've had to do it. Fundamentally, there's nothing new about bl individually bladed discs and fir, fir tree retention systems. It's how all of the big engines work, it's how a lot of the bigger helicopter engines work, and it offers profound benefits in terms of the failure sequence, the lifing and the thermal stresses that the engines get as they cycle from hot to cold and hot to cold. So, this isn't anything that we've invented, it's nothing new. What we're doing is just doing as diligent a job as we possibly can on the production engineering of it to make sure we can deliver these things at the right price point. We spoke last time how we'd been doing a lot of process development on the fir tree roots themselves, how we'd been using wire erosion to be able to cut out those uh, fir trees in, in replacement for a broaching process. Um, we did some initial trials on that and found that we got a small amount of recast layer. So the guys have gone back, optimized the process, and we've now got to a point where we can produce forged discs with fir tree roots in them using wire EDM uh, to be able to uh, without any recast at all so the brittle layer of remelted and re-solidified material that would otherwise ruin uh, the mechanical properties of the disc has been completely eliminated and we've done all of the uh, the metrology examinations now to demonstrate that we've also followed on and carried out that work on blade roots as well so traditionally blade roots are ground but we can also now produce the same fir tree feature that you can see in the inset in the the slide there using a wire erosion process and this gives us a really cost-effective way to make the uh, initial few engines prior to putting these things into large-scale production. It also allows us to much more rapidly tweak that design if we find we need to on test. So really really pleased with the process that we've made on that front. Now one of the areas that we did a lot of work on uh, uh, about 12 to 18 months ago was our in-house casting processes that enable us to produce all of the really complicated castings that essentially build up the majority of a gas turbine engine. Uh, many of the bearing housings, some of the out external casings, the blades, the veins, all of these things require really sophisticated casting processes to, uh, to cast alloys that really don't like being cast in an oxygenated environment. So we've been developing a, an inert environment casting process to enable us to produce low cost casting, uh, low cost turbine blades, as well as some of the internal castings in a cost effective capital in, uh, in intensive, uh, non-capital intensive uh, format. And over the course of the, the last few months, 
uh, we've essentially arrived in a position now where we're ready to cast our very first GT50 turbine blades for both the gas generator and also the power turbine. Now to do this we've had to string a range of processes together including rapid prototyping the, the investments themselves, developing the shelling and the block moulding uh, processes to be able to make the casting itself, burning all of those out and proving we can remove all the residue and then over the course of the, the next few days we'll be taking those shells that you can see on the slide there uh, and investment casting the first GT50 materials in production grade materials with our own process. So really, really, really pleased to, uh, to see that finally come together. That's been a very difficult one uh, for us to, uh, to, to get together. I should also say in the work that we did previously, we did demonstrate, as you can see on the slide there, that we get the crystal structure and the microstructure that we need using this process and that there's no uh, sort of uh, oxidization in there that would otherwise damage the, the mechanical properties of the, the blade. So really pleased with, uh, with how all of that's, that's come together. Um, the other piece of work that's going on at the moment is we froze the annular combustor a little while ago and the guys have been running at full speed to essentially get the combustion system into production for the GT50 engine. So over the course of the last few months you've seen myself and Mark go out and sort of qualify and procure a range of equipment that we need to be able to produce the combustion system from sheet metal super alloy and then roll it and form it uh, and drill and weld it, press it and spin it to form the complex uh, 3D combustion can. We're almost at, uh, almost at the end of that journey now. Uh, we're in the process of producing the tools to roll the finished rings that will make the first of the, the combustion, uh, combustion units and we'll be bringing you the, the updates for that over the, the course of the next uh, month or two as we produce the first GT50 uh, annular combustor. So really, really pleased with how all of that has come together as well. I mean, from, from my perspective, I guess you guys have watched us develop all of these bits and pieces over the, the last few months. It's very apparent to us here in the team that a lot of this stuff is starting to converge now. The detail in the, the design is profoundly uh, getting there and a lot of the manufacturing processes are either ready to go or very close to, to ready to go to allow us to, to build these prototype parts uh, for the remainder of parts we need for the, uh, the prototype engine. So really pleased with all of that. Let's go and have a look at what we've been doing on the, uh, on the engine. So as I mentioned, a lot of the focus on the over the course of the last week or so hasn't been on the glamorous bits that I showed you over the course of the uh, in the in the last update, but on things that look much more uh, benign and innocuous. This is the the inlet casing. So the air is drawn into the air, the engine through here. Your compressor sits in the back of this casing, uh, and this actually provides the primary load path for how we attach the helicopter to the structure via these mounting pads here, and then. The the large bevel gear set that drives back up to the main rotor is encased within this bottom uh, bottom housing here. Now, why this is significant is it's actually a very difficult piece to cast in one piece, but casting it in one piece is really, excuse me, really important from the point of view of value engineering and really important from the point of view of structural integrity uh, and dynamic stiffness. So we've been doing a bunch of work with this both in terms of rapid prototyping processes as an enabler for casting and also in terms of starting to simplify this design. What I should say is since we made this one we've actually made the thing even more complicated by having to graft a, uh, an, ancest, uh, an ancillary gearbox on the front of this to drive the uh, the fuel pumps and, and what have you. But nevertheless, this is coming together as well. And the same casting process that we're developing to produce the turbine blades, the machine that we're going to, to procure and use for that is actually capable of making big aluminium castings like this. And even the castings, the biggest castings that go into the whole aircraft, uh, the upper and the lower uh, main rotor gearbox housings. So all of that is coming together very, very nicely. Now, in the last update, we introduced the, uh, uh, the current state of build on the, the GT50 engine. A lot of these early components now have been through detailed analysis. We're doing the last elements of the, uh, the structural optimization on this to clear the engine for prototype, uh, prototype component release. 
Um, the compressor is pretty much there uh, now in terms of the, the optimization of the blade frequencies and the last couple of details with the secondary air system. A lot of the details in the shaft are almost there as well and so we expect a lot of these components to be released the next few weeks and then of course the big effort over the last couple of weeks has been the turbine blades so the way the process works is essentially the first thing that we produce is a wax uh, turbine blade we've actually made this one out of uh, a stereolithography plastic resin for the purposes of prototyping but we tool this in aluminium and then injection mold wax versions of the turbine blades in in production from that we then assemble a range of these things on a wax sprue inside a casting vessel. This can then be used to shell or block mould the, uh, the blades and then we burn out the investments and then in the place of this we can then pour in metal to create your super alloy turbine blade. And all of that process development has been going on over the course of the, the last few weeks with various partners that we're, we're working with and that applies equally well to the power turbine blades as well. So there's the investment you start with and there's the, uh, the super alloy blade that you finish with. I should, just to be clear, iterate, these ones aren't cast. This is what we're going to be casting over the course of the next uh, few days. So I also mentioned that we'd been doing some cut-up trials on the, uh, the, the root detail of these blades. So these blades are actually retained by these fir trees at the, bottom of the, uh, at the bottom of the blade platform. And so making sure that you've got the mechanical properties that you think you have in there is absolutely critical. Now, the last thing that we would want is for there to be any traces of brittle material left on this area. So having wire eroded those profiles out, we've then polished those and had those under uh, the microscope and done various other non-destructive techniques tests on them to verify that we've got exactly the mechanical properties that we need in a range of these samples here. Uh, here's just three of them to make sure that delivers everything we need it to to uh, successfully complete the test in the in the engine. In addition to that uh, we've been doing a lot of work on additional casings so we showed you previously that we'd uh, expeditiously rapid prototyped a, uh, the first of the engine casings. The, the guys have subsequently been back and machined those ones from, uh, from solid for the early test stand. Um, so that's just come off the, uh, the three axis over the course of the, the last, few, last few days. So all of this stuff is coming together very nicely. The next major milestone for us on this is getting those turbine blades cast and getting our hands on the, uh, the first of the combustion systems. So really pleased with how that's coming together. Speaking of the, uh, the combustion systems, I've probably explained to you previously that the, um, the combustor is essentially made up of a series of welded rings. These rings are purchased as flat super alloy sheet and then cut into strip. We then form these into loose circles um, and then we roll the profile, if you just don't look down the edge of that, we roll the profile that we need to allow these to sl uh, fit together as leaves uh, and provide cooling air either side of each of these leaves to protect the um, to protect the, the metal from the searing temperatures inside the, the combustor. And to do that, we procured this piece of equipment here, which is essentially a, a rolling machine that forms that profile by rolling the, uh, the flat metal sheet between two formed rollers. That process is now here. We're currently producing the tools to enable us to produce the latest version of the, the combustor. And then the final stage in all of that is these things get assembled uh, into a jig and then we uh, drill 2,000 individual cooling and dilution holes uh, within the assembled structure. The machine that you can see here is actually a, a machine that's used once you've rolled the um, once you've rolled the forms, we put a set of tools in here and this expands the ring to be perfectly cylindrical, perfectly round uh, and exactly to the diameter that we need. So even using these relatively simple fabrication processes, we can still manufacture these components to the tight, tight tolerances that are required inside a gas turbine engine. So that's an update on where we are with the production of the GT50 engine and we'll give you an update next month, hopefully, with some completed gas turbine blades. Okay, 
So one of the things that I want to, uh, want to introduce now as we produce more and more components for both the aircraft and engine is a live update from around the, uh, the DC. So what we'll do now is Josh and I will take a walk around the DC and I'll show you exactly what we're producing here uh, right at the minute, right this week. So let's start on the, uh, on the grinder and I'll demonstrate what we've been doing in terms of producing hill manufactured bearings. So we've spoken at length before about our gas generator bearings, the really high speed ones that live in the, uh, the centre of the engine. Those are, are currently frozen, pending some final loads from the, uh, the airframe team upstairs. What the guys have been doing over the course uh, of the last couple of weeks in particular is rolling out a bunch of the less demanding bearings. So there's 38 different types of bearings within HX50 and GT50 and each of these requires super tight tolerances and individual tweaks to the manufacturing process. So the guys have currently got um, a relatively modest bearing out of the main rotor gearbox, the input stages of the main rotor gearbox on here and you'll notice all of the learnings from the previous work where we hold these things onto the machine in a very careful way so that we don't clamp or distort it. So we're producing lots of bearings from within main rotor gearbox, tail rotor gearbox and downstream in the engine drivetrain at the moment on the, uh, the grinder. So that's all coming together very nicely. Uh, since the last update we've taken delivery of the final piece of equipment that we need to be able to quality control the bearings that we produce here at uh, DC1. So whenever you did uh, carrying out precision engineering it's not just a case of being able to make the parts you also have to be able to measure the parts that you've made and verify that you've got what you think you've got this machine here is a, a roncom and what this does is it allows us to measure the cylindricity and the roundness of each of the bearing profiles extremely accurately and since we've had this we've been able to demonstrate that we can get agreement on the the measurements that we make on the high precision cmm and this uh, to within 0.8 of a micron. So tiny, tiny tolerance is exactly where you need to be for making bearings. Uh, bearings. So with the RONCOM and the SURFCOM and the CMM, we can now measure down to the levels that are required to be able to repeatably produce all of the bearings that are necessary for both GT50 and HX50. So pleased with how all of that's coming on. Uh, big focus on the five axis at the moment is production of main rotor gearbox gears. So uh, we're producing several transmissions at the moment to enable us to get a pair of these transmissions on the test bench and running through a, an extended live test to clear them for flight testing. Uh, what we've got on here at the moment is another one of the Planet gears. So these are be currently being hard machined. So that is aerospace grey gear steel. It's been through an aerospace approved uh, hardening process. All of the uh, traceability and all of the, the measurement that feeds into this process has been done and locked down. And very shortly we'll have a full set of those for two HX50 main rotor transmission. So pleased with how that's coming on. One of the things that you'll notice shortly, or I'll show you shortly, is we've actually, actually had to produce uh, act actually had to procure a second five axis just to keep up with the demand of producing uh, gear and bearing components. On the three axis at the moment uh, we've got the second HX50 main rotor gearbox casing about to be produced. Uh, so this block of, uh, of aluminium at the moment will, will shortly be turned into the lower housing from a main rotor gearbox. So Josh I don't know if you just want to point at that one over there so people can see. The lower half of that gearbox is what we're producing over here at the moment. And then earlier in the, the week, uh, we've been producing the first of the brake calipers for the HX50 wheeled undercarriage in addition to the brake, uh, sorry, brake discs in addition, addition to the brake calipers. And the second job you can see on the bed of the three axis over here is actually uh, the opposite hand of that, uh, that caliper. So lots and lots of uh, components being manufactured at the, at the moment. Over here on the, the lathe, we've also got a uh, further engine transmission gearbox. So this is the input uh, pinion that sits at the top of the speed reduction gearbox. And this is one of the three, that we're, three sets that we're producing for long-term testing. So one for the demonstrator and two for long-term testing where we're going to run these for 5,000 hours. And then if we go over to the new lathe, this machine's been bought specifically 
to keep up with gear and bearing demand. What you can see on the floor here actually is this is the first HX50 wheeled undercarriage. So it doesn't look like much yet. That, uh, that material landed today, so over the course of the next couple of weeks, we'll be making the first set of undercarriage for the, the HX50. On the second lathe that we've got over here, uh, we're currently producing the, the, the gear. This is the first stage wheel for the speed reduction gearbox. So integral curvic couplings, all the lightning holes in there, and that's now literally just waiting for its teeth on the five axis. So from concept through to reality. Here is the very first uh, batch of sprag, uh, sprag clutch housings uh, for the back end of the GT50 engine. So the first three for the first three uh, build transmissions. Uh, and then here we've got the uh, sprag clutch output shaft that connects with that device down there through the, uh, the sprag clutch itself. First three of those there, again, from concept to reality. And something a little bit different over here is on the lathe at the moment, uh, we're currently producing the first HX50 wheel hubs in there, so the first set of uh, alloy rims. And that'll get finished over the course of the, uh, the next day or so. Um, given the amount of machines that we're now operating in parallel, we've also recently invested in some offline tool setting equipment. So this allows us to fit tools into to tool holders and interchange them between the machines without taking a machine out of production, as very shortly we're going to be limited by production capacity on a lot of these machines. So that came in over the course of the last couple of weeks as well. And then again, this is the second five axis that we've just installed. Uh, this came in two weeks ago now. It's just been calibrated uh, and Mark's currently got this one working on again, more high speed gears for the GT50 transmission. So that's in essence what, we'd be, what we're up to at the moment in terms of machining the, the mechanical components. Let's go and have a look at what uh, Dave's been up to down at DC2 on the, uh, the composite side. So uh, since we introduced the first HX50 tail boom last week, the guys have been making some minor, minor modifications to the tail tools, and then they're currently producing the first two uh, structurally representative tail booms for the two machines that we're going to uh, present later in the, the year. So that's occupying a lot of the guys in terms of tool preparation, in terms of kit cutting and laminating, uh, and in terms of executing and locking down that process for us. So the guys are quite busy with that down there. Um, you will notice that we have a, an, an open engine deck on the top of the, the airframe. The engine sits in the bathtub that you can see there. And then you've got an open engine deck where your tail rotor drive chain runs down the back. That's covered by a tail cover. We're making the tools and also the parts for the tail covers for the first few tail booms down at DC2 at the moment as well. Uh, and we've also talked briefly about the, the improvement to the, the brow line that we're able to do. Now we've had the latest structural optimization results uh, in that show us we're able to, to move that up a little bit. So the guys have just been proving out the modifications that they can make to some of these beams uh, to slen slender them down in the way that's most conducive to the best possible flying experience. Um, and then of course, on top of that, we're busy producing fuselage six and seven down there as well at the moment, um, as well as producing the remaining glazing patterns. We've also been doing some work on the very first HX50 uh, door. So this is the, uh, this is the, the first co-pilot uh, door that we've, we've produced. Again, ignore these components here, they're, they're uh, unfinished bits of, of trimming. This allows us to essentially prove out the hinge strategy, the ability to take the doors on and off, the ability to seal, adequately verify the stiffness of the doors and a bunch of other practical trials that allow us to verify the quality of what we're producing uh, for, the, uh, for the aircraft fuselage as well. And then one other thing that uh, I just wanted to, to mention on in the, in the context of some of the things that have been going on in, uh, in the press recently is the, the suitability of carbon fibre as a whole uh, as a material for, for aircraft. Now, um, carbon is an amazing material. It's not good for everything, but it's really, really good for aircraft. If you take this portion of the tail boom here, okay, 
What I've got here is a section of the laminate. It's ludicrously light. And the way it's manufactured is this, this particular laminate is literally just a single ply of carbon, a, uh, a honeycomb core, and then another single uh, piece of carbon. It's really, really light. And to give you an idea of its strength and stiffness, you can jump up and down on this and it can take a full person's weight. And that's from something that allows us to make that tail boom for just over 20 kilos all in. And so carbon's an amazing material when it's used correctly. It's extremely stiff, it's extremely strong. Uh, and in terms of fatigue, because it's essentially made up of lots of individual load paths within the material, bathed in a resin that passes the load from one fiber to another, it's full of natural crack stoppers, which means that, that from the point of view of a helicopter where the thing is permanently being shaken by the main rotor, it's very difficult for cracks to propagate through carbon fibre. So for our application, it is an incredible material. It's difficult, as we've shown, to, to make good composite parts, but once you can do it, you can make the stiffest, strongest uh, and most damage tolerant parts that you can uh, with any material that's available for making aircraft. So for our application, it is an absolute no-brainer that it's the right material to use. And then the other thing, of course, is as you've seen from our trials on the crashworthy seats, it has an incredible ability to absorb energy. So in terms of absorbing the energy from a, a stroking seat, or in terms of developing a crash structure on the bottom of the aircraft that absorbs energy as well, carbon is definitely the right choice if you're making lightweight flying structures. So rest assured uh, carbon is not a, a, a villain material it has amazing properties if you know how to use it properly and one of the final things that it does that's really important for a helicopter is that the main rotor is constantly shaking on the top of the, uh, the fuselage and we have to be able to tune this structure so it doesn't want to vibrate at those specific frequencies and carbon because we can align the fibers in every direction or well, any direction we want to we can tune those modes of vibration with far more precision and ease than you could with an isotropic metal material so again carbon is amazing for what we're doing with it with hx50 let's head back Okay, let's talk briefly about the, uh, the Digi cockpit. So uh, one of the things that we've been doing over the course of the last few months really is interacting with our, our customers through factory tours and when individual customers come to see us and receiving as much feedback as we can about the, the Digi cockpit user interface. Um, one, of the, one or two of the areas that have attracted some, uh, some comments are the RPM gauge, the airspeed indicator and general readability. And those are, are areas where we're essentially leveraging the, uh, the, di the, the digital workflow um, capability to be able to optimize those with feedback very, very quickly. Um, we're also developing all of the other layers of the integrated pilot interface. So that single user interface right down by your, where your collective hand is to be able to control everything that you need to when you interact with the, uh, with the system. Um, we're also developing some new areas of the Digi Cockpit, the infotainment screens, the splash screens that you have at startup, and then the startup screens that manage engine start and, and key, uh, key phases of flight. Uh, other than general, general crews and normal operations. We've also started now to work on the integration of the, uh, the DigiCockpit with the app. And of course, we're heavily now into uh, the certification process and getting the whole system ready for certification. So we spoke to you last month about um, how we're moving to target hardware, how we've al almost got the certifiable software stack done. And this, over the course of the last few weeks, we've been engaging uh, with our DO178C and DO254 specialists to look at software certification and complex hardware certification so we can start that process in ample time to get those things out into, uh, into market. Some of the new areas that we've been working on on the Digi Cockpit are the left screen. Um, obviously, when you've got a flying pilot there, you can have a copy of the instruments, but we're just about to start now looking at the proper uh, integration of the infotainment, uh, the 
the integration of the camera views and to put a, we're looking at putting the largest possible traffic scope on there that we can and of course we're developing all of this into the, uh, the Hill digital ecosystem as well as providing robust connections to the uh, electronic flight book app for the flight control computer. Um, we've also now taken delivery of the, the very first set of fully into, well, uh, we call it an exploded board, but the very first set of target hardware that includes uh, both the system on module board, the screens, the analog boards, the power uh, supply units, the serial expansion board, the discrete expansion board. All of this has now been received, tested and functional, and we have our digital cockpit software running on our intended target hardware. So the, the, uh, the Digi team have been incredibly busy with all of that. We've got the majority of the peripherals connected to this now, uh, and the system's working uh, really pretty well. Um, one of the areas that uh, Martin in particular has been focusing on over the, the course of the last few weeks has been the really high integrity software and hardware uh, for critical functions. So your engine management, your speed control and your flight control com computer. This whole development process has to be a fully certifiable uh, tool chain. Uh, and so this means we're using essentially model based design to develop the control algorithms and the top level control logic uh, all the way down to squirting out binary, binary code that runs on, on bare metal. Um, all of this we're running, running on chips that are, are available at the moment but as with a lot of uh, areas we're having to be really really careful with chip selection because the global supply chain for key chips such as uh, high integrity chips is really challenging at the, at the moment so making good progress on that too. One very, uh, uh, very important but uh, challenging area is the, the work that's been done by Martin on the electrical system at the moment. We've got a, a, a largely developed electrical system. It's been mature for, for quite a while now, um, but we're actually now going through the, the process of detailing the, the very detailed interactions between the wiring loom and the rest of the airframe. So this means we have to develop uh, essentially a linked uh, wiring system with our 3D CAD and Martin's been developing a, a range of processes to be able to get all of that into the 3D environment so that the, the structural guys make sure that proper allowances are made of that uh, within, the, uh, within the system. Uh, and we're, we will also be shortly starting testing on the, the full electrical system as well, starting with the power electronics and the starter generator, and then working through the rest of the components that make up the electrical system. Jen Yu and his guys have just spec'd up a, a new test cell, which will sit over here by the, uh, the avionics suite to be able to test all the electrical hardware that we've got to put into the, uh, the prototype airframe. So really pleased with, uh, with how that's coming on. Uh, another big area that we've been working on recently is the approvals piece of work. Now, obviously, uh, we have a, a fairly unique dual role approval model. Uh, this was developed in conjunction with the, the CAA in order to promote innovation by reduce, uh, while reducing time to market, but making sure that we fully comply with the very latest certification standards. Now this requires us to obtain a design organisation approval, a production organisation approval, a flight test organisation approval and maintenance organisation approvals and we have full oversight from the Civil Avi Aviation Authority for all of those things. So over the course of last week we had a, a, a team of delegates up from the UK CAA and we walked them through all of the, the process, where we are with the, the development of the airframe, the engine, the avionics, the range of components and systems that are in production, the way we control our production environment and the next steps uh, in moving all of these things through the, the certification uh, process. The guys were very pleased with, with what they've seen. Uh, if a, uh, a little nervous about the huge volume of work that uh, is ahead for them, in taking this all the way through the approval process for both permit and also full type certificate for HC50. So really pleased with, uh, with how that's come together. Um, we've also been progressing uh, very positively on the factory build. So as you're aware, we're uh, currently in planning permission for a 365,000 square foot facility over at Cresswell, about 20, 25 mi uh, minutes from, from here. Um, all of the additional 
uh, acoustic work that was required by the environmental health uh, people will be completed by the end of July. All of the requirement, uh, all of the additional required documents will have been submitted to the planning authorities within this month. Uh, and the next available committee then is in September. So within September, we should finally have our decision on the, uh, the planning for the, uh, the production facility. Uh, that still keeps us just about within our timescales for starting production. Uh, and the design and build tender work is about to, uh, to start as well. So pushing those tenders out to the contractors that will actually build this facility for us. The other point that I, I wanted to make, however, is don't be distracted by the process of just building the enormous box for the factory, because building the box is just the easy bit. Um, the next thing you've got to do, of course, is fill it with a, um, a manufacturing system. Now, because we're a vertically integrated uh, organisation, we've got a huge head start on this. Each and every one of these machines that you see in this factory will end up going to the big factory, but with its brothers and sisters. All of the detailed uh, part manufacturing processes are being done right here, right now. But on top of that, we then need to build a manufacturing system uh, and deal with the factory design, the logistics, the factory control, the quality processes, and scaling up the workforce. And so in order to do that, we're now aggressively recruiting into the manufacturing team um, the first part of that was to produce, uh, was to promote Mark uh, to our production director and Mark is now recruiting into that team to uh, essentially develop out the full scale production system that has to be developed and all of the equipment pro procured along the, the same parallel timeline that we're producing the, the building itself. So there's lots of work going on at the moment in terms of factory layout, cell design. We're in the process of scoping a robotics development cell to allow us to, to prove out all of the robot machining, uh, all of the robot quality control uh, processes and a variety of other activities that uh, we'll be automating within the factory. And a lot of the, com the composite processes will shortly be receiving detailed attention in terms of how we get the labour down uh, and make those processes as slick and as repeatable as, as, prop, uh, as possible. So congratulations to, to Mark um, and there's a, an awful lot of fun work to do now in, in getting us ready for, for producing these aircraft in volumes of 500 to 1000 a year. So uh, in terms of the business overall, over the, the course of the, the last month, uh, sales have remained extremely strong. So we've now sold a total of 865 aircraft comprising 702 X models and 163 Cs in 61 countries. So as we get closer and closer to market, more and more people are, are coming out of the sales pipeline. So as I say every month, there's never been a better time to buy than now if you want to beat the rush. So on that note, uh, I'll uh, pause for breath and welcome any questions that you, you might have from across the program. Thank you. Wow, 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 Jason. This was an impressive one. I was paying attention to all the details. And let me tell you, now I really appreciate this one because I feel that it's kind of a shift right now that we're going through. We see a linear uh, development up to now and we're getting into that phase that you just described to us some time ago into exponential development and everything is happening all fronts with so many things going on and so many parts and systems are getting together great stuff that really appreciate it was an impressive one now we're going to the ask me anything session we're gonna have an hour exactly actually 58 minutes a lot of time we receive a lot of questions and Misha and I are going to be taking turns uh, to present these questions to Jason Again, if you want, you still, there's still time to, uh, to put those questions on the chat, so you can go ahead and continue to add those. Um, all the time we have these 15 minutes, we'll be using that and going fairly quickly. So as much as you can, we'll be also answering as quickly as we can. So the first question is coming from Kenneth and uh, Jason. It's about uh, actually after you receive the delivery aircraft, I suppose that's the context is do we have to take any tests or exam or any preparation of, uh, yes, you're good to go in terms of flying this specific aircraft? So the HS-50, do you have any tests associated with the ability to fly the aircraft? 
Yeah, so here in the, the UK and across uh, Europe, we have a, a type rating system. So every time you, you want to fly a new type of helicopter, you have to take a five hour type rating. So each aircraft is sold with a five hour type rating. And even where territories have class ratings and you don't necessarily require that, we would still recommend that you come and take the five hour course so that we can make sure you're, you're completely familiar with all of the, uh, the systems on board. The digital cockpit is very simple, but it's very different to anything you will have flown uh, in traditional helicopters. And if it's the first time that you're flying with autopilot systems or with retractable undercarriage, it would be a good idea to come and have a go with one of our instructors. So everybody gets that opportunity. At first, it'll be factory based until we can get more instructors rolled out around the world, but then we'll push that closer to, to people's uh, location to make it as easy and convenient as possible. Excellent. Next question is from Kobus, and he's asking, or he's actually uh, making a comment. He says, we have a new energy source. No need to ever fuel your helicopter again. Would you be interested? Yeah, I, I, I would, yeah, but you'll have to convince me that it doesn't defy any of the, uh, the laws of physics because they sometimes get in the way. Okay. All right, so from Paul, is um, everything goes if, if if everything goes according to plan when do you think you will deliver the last order you have at the moment so that uh, serial number 702 actually it is updated at jason it's already 703 uh, but uh, exactly 703 uh, when is when you think uh, 703 is going to be uh delivered uh, giving the plan that you have in front of you of production so we're saying mid the, about this time of the year, but uh, we want your confirmation uh, in 2026. Yeah, that, that's basically right. I was just trying to do the maths in my head. Yes. So there's a, there's, a subtle, there's a subtle nuance to the numbers in that obviously when you start production, first we have to take the staff on, then we have to start making parts because we then need the parts to make sub-assemblies. And then we then need the sub-assemblies to make helicopters. So there's a ramp into production, which then means we're actually setting the factory up to produce more than we're declaring at the moment so that we can make up that, those numbers in the first year. But by the time you're about uh, halfway through the second year, we'll be uh, bang up to, to date with that. So yes, those numbers are right as we stand today. Hey, excellent. And Boniface is asking, how does the cyclic work? Can you uh, maybe give a demonstration or just give it a, a bit of an explanation of how the cyclic works? Uh, yeah, it'll be a bit clunky, but let's do a demonstration. Josh, do you want to come over to the, the H off? So Josh, if you can get an angle just up there. So the cyclic is uh, essentially currently designed as a center post cyclic that you can see just inside the, the center console in there. Excuse the crudity, this is purely for human factors checks. So this motion uh, actually doesn't do anything. That's purely to allow you to get the cyclic into a, a comfortable position. And then that center post provides the motion for forwards, aft, and then side to side. It's a bit clunky in this at the moment because it's not connected to anything, so it's just a, a dead weight. But essentially, that's how the, the system works. So it, it's uh, similar to the, the center post cyclic that you might have seen in, in other helicopters, but it's all disguised behind the, uh, it's all dis disguised behind the, the center console, so uh, it's elegantly presented for you. So very simple and very familiar. Fantastic. Uh, so the next one, uh, before actually I ask the next one to you, Jason, there's a general request uh, information question here, which is, would you be posting the questions and replies as a document available for anybody to review after the AMA? I, yes, absolutely. We've been doing that. You can count on that. It's going to be available after this uh, AMA. We're going to have a summary of all the questions for everybody to review and also the recording. Uh, we do the recording of this and then we share it on the, your YouTube channel. You can review this one and the past ones as well. Everything is documented. So next question uh, from Colin, uh, Jason, is when have you scheduled your first bench run of the engine and the first flight test? 
So in a, in a previous uh, update, we explained how we're doing the testing of the engine. So the engine is tested as part of a phased build. So we start with essentially the inlet casing that I showed you over there with the compressor module and the combustor and some components just to hold the, the shaft in position. Uh, and then we build that up with the compressor turbine. Then we run the whole gas generator. In, the, in parallel with that, we run the engine drivetrain. We're producing those bits at the moment. And then once all of that's working, we then connect the two with the power turbine. And we should have all of the bits uh, for that ready by the autumn time. So by autumn, we should be in a position to start doing some of those early tests. There's obviously a million things. Jason, uh, may I go. just interject and actually a question is, there's this sometimes some misunderstanding of, it looks like we're building, you're building the engine you don't know what's going to happen and there's a moment everything is together everything is 100 percent and then it is oh will it run or not right there's a misconception i think of that process yeah and can you clarify different actually tests that you do the many many tests of different systems yeah. to get yeah, to that yeah, point yeah. that when you're running it actually it's the ultimate goal but it's not something that you're looking for a specific date that you're going to see if it works or not you know what i mean so that, that, i think there's more yeah. of a yeah, yeah, yeah. standing there right yeah Let, let's let's be clear about that uh, not just for the engine but for the whole helicopter if you tried right. to design all of this from scratch build it and bolt it together there is absolutely no way on earth that it would work uh, what you've got to do is verify the thing part at a time subsystem at a time and then grow the subsystems into sub assemblies and then you graduate to the full thing so in terms of the engine the the two things that will be tested first uh, will be uh, the starter generator actually which is going to be tested in late October uh, early November over on on the bench over here we've got the engine drivetrain which will strap two of those so that's the speed reduction gearbox that comes out the back of the power turbine all the way down under the engine up into the main rotor gearbox we can test that uh, by sticking a pair of them together and driving the thing at full speed and full torque for 5,000 hours so that can start literally as soon as the last component comes off the the, the machine and then we start to build the engine up piece by piece. So like I said, you start with initial fire up test. So starter generator, once we've proven that that works, gets connected to the compressor and the combustor. And we spin that at low speed and make sure that we can light the combustor and that the combustor temperatures are all sensible and what we expect. Once we know that that works, we can put the compressor turbine into the test rig. And then you've got a self-sustaining compressor turbine combination, your gas generator. Um, then we test that and run the engine through its entire operating range. During that phase, we're not using our fuel pumps, we're not using our lubrication pumps, we're not using our, they're all off the shelf pumps so that we can focus on the bits of the engine that are critical. The bits that we've made and we can tune those parameters to wherever they need to be to make it work. So it's, a, it's an exercise in giving yourself the ability to modify on the bench and to develop on the bench. And then once we've got all of that working, the whole engine can be put together and run together on life support. The other thing I would say is at that stage we wouldn't be running with our own FADEC. We'd be running with a very simple control system off the shelf and once we've characterized what the control system needs to do for the engine we can tune the parameters in our own FADEC and run the engine with our own FADEC and our own hardware as well. So it builds up step by step by step and only when you're satisfied that you've got everything working that you want to work do you then start investing serious money in the longer term endurance tests. But it's step by step, little by little. So if something doesn't work, you've got the least amount of stuff to modify. It's the quickest way to get through development. But as we get into testing, everybody needs to expect that there will be hiccups. Everybody needs to expect that we'll find problems and fix them because that's how these programs work. That's what development's like. Don't be frightened by that. That's how it is for everybody. Exactly. That's a, that's a really good point. I'm glad that you yeah, just to, to remind, did you address uh, just to address the, the flight test itself? So the, the date for it's the flight test? Yeah, yeah. So, the, so at the, at the moment... Just to clarify on that sequence, so we have this yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, the engine needs to be qualified before we can take it flying, but it only has to be proven to be 
uh, safe enough to do the, the experimental flight tests. So we need to prove out a certain amount of performance and life on the engine. Once we've done that, we can justify doing a small amount of flying. And then we just have to keep the engine in front of the aircraft program. So obviously there are some interlinks there. If you have problems on the engine side, it'll have an impact on the flight mm -hmm. test side. Right. That's, that's life. Um, but, but fundamentally, that, that ha that's how, how that works. And the same process applies to the, the aircraft. The way we test the, the aircraft is that essentially, if you take the structure, for example, the first test that we'll do on that is put that in a big metal frame and pull it to pieces. So apply representative flight loads to it and pull it and pull it and prove that it breaks at or beyond where we think it's going to break and how we think it's going to break. And then once we've done that statically, we'll then use hydraulic rams to push it and pull it repeatedly and sim um, simulate lift uh, landing and taking off and all of the different loads that come down from the main rotor head to just exercise and distress that structure to clear enough life to be able to go and fly it, measure the real loads, and then you come back and you repeat those tests and do a full life cycle test on the ground on a test rig. Similarly, we need to stick one of these things with its fuel tanks in and drop it, make sure it doesn't spill any fuel. That's the criteria. So all of those sorts of things are done ahead of, uh, ahead of going flying and as part of the, the full approval process. Very exciting times ahead, and I look forward to all of that. Um, next question is from Martin, and he's asking, uh, do we know what the likely decibels will be inside of the helicopter? He's just thinking about uh, hearing protection for animals inside the aircraft. Uh, that's... No is the honest answer to that. I've not calculated that. I, I think if you were to take um, a typical helicopter today, we're not going to be wildly different. Um, we've all got the same problems in that you, you really can't afford the weight to put the kind of acoustic insulation materials into the, the fuselage that you, you would use in a car. Um, in the really big helicopters where they, they do that, they're essentially trading off useful payload against cabin comfort for the VVIP versions. Uh, it's possible that we could look at that as, a, as an option, but it will cost you dearly in terms of your, your payload capability. So I, if, if you take a, a representative machine, uh, maybe an EC120 or a, a 66, it's not gonna be a lot different from that. Fantastic, Michael has the following question. Exotic, exotic cars companies normally have showrooms where you book a meeting for customization, where they have a color, material samples and help you design Will this be similar with the customization of your helicopter? Will you need to book a meeting at Hill Helicopters headquarters? So uh, that moment I, a year before. Yeah, I, I currently don't know the answer to that. We haven't decided what we're, what we're doing there. Um, fundamentally, we're not going to have large amounts of, uh, of dealerships around the, the, uh, the world, certainly at this stage of the, the program. So, uh, and 12 months from the, the time the early machines uh, are going to be delivered from, the, uh, from the, the facility, our facility won't be built yet. So that's not an option either. So I think in the, in, in the early period, it will be some form of on, online process, perhaps with, with some physical element to it, but we need to work out how we're going to do that. It's not something that we've given a, a great deal of con consideration to just yet. It, it clearly uh, forms a, a key part of people's expectations in the future and there will certainly be, faci be facilities like that at the factory they're in the plan that we're building but they won't be in available in time for the very early machines I'm afraid. Okay and uh, Craig is asking a question that is a repeated question several times on the different AMAs but we do have a, a largely new audience on, on these AMAs and so I'm going to ask it again it says have you considered hydrogen combustion propulsion? Uh, he says, my friend is an aeronautical engineer and says it's workable. Yeah, I, I did a, a project um, working for another helicopter manufacturer, converting a helicopter about that size, size to hydrogen propulsion uh, just after 2010. And in my, my experience, um, you can show on a piece of paper that it's just about workable. But by the time you've taken that enormous hydrogen fuel cell, uh, that enormous hydrogen fuel tank, uh, and all of the additional equipment, whether it be fuel cells or whether it be hydrogen uh, combustion, through a certification process and put all the redundancy in, it just becomes impractical. So 
In my view, at the moment, I don't think it's worth it. I think it would add a lot of cost, a lot of complexity, and I think you'd end up with a helicopter that has a lot less performance than a synthetically fueled uh, conventional gas turbine powered helicopter. So yes, technically as an academic exercise, it is workable. Uh, is it work workable as a, uh, as a commercially viable helicopter today? No, it's absolutely not. Um, so it's, it's not one for us just yet. We think uh, synthetic or, or bio-derived uh, fuel replacements are the right thing to do at this, at this point. <coughs> Excuse me. Next question from Keith Pine is, what is the time frame for the HSP <coughs> that can hold in a hover OG and IG on a sustained autopilot? Uh, the, the time period? Yes, the it, time how, period. Uh, yeah, how long well, can it hold? Well, it'll, it'll hold a max gross weight out of ground effect hover uh, at 10,000 feet on an ISA plus 15 day. Um, on maximum continuous power and at maximum continuous power it burns 35 gallons an hour um, so you could have potentially five hours um, depending on what payload you're carrying there so if it's a if it's a, a photo shoot mission then you can have potentially five hours as long as your camera equipment isn't too heavy it is linked with autopilot so the question is the autopilot can the autopilot hold that cover yeah yeah, so you're, limit, you're limited to what a two-axis autopilot yeah. will, will do. So you, you've still got to maintain power yourself. As the weight, as the weight drops, you'll have to drop the power. Uh, you'll still have mm -hmm. to maintain your control yourself. Unless you have the four-axis system, then it will hold that, that point in, in space. And at that point, yeah. you're limited to the fidelity of, of GPS. So you're not going to be any, any better than about a three-meter box. Okay. So just uh, before I ask the next question, I just want to clarify that. So on the two axis autopilot, it will be able to hold a hover with uh, the cyclic, is that correct? Yeah, it'll do everything you want it to do on the, the cyclic. So it, has the, it can have the capability to, uh, to hold a point in space. Okay, excellent. Uh, next question is from Clint and it's asking um, about the size of an iPad. So what would your preference be on the perfect size for an iPad for the DigiCockpit? Digi Big one. So if you, Josh, if you just want to turn around. So this is the, uh, this is the, the avionics test bench. We haven't powered it up because we're not using it today, but that's the 12.9 iPad Pro. Um, and I think with the distance it is away from your, your head and reach, I think for, for our aircraft, that's the, the perfect size. We've allowed for that. We've allowed for some growth and variation as, as Apple tends to vary these things. But personally, I'd put the biggest one you can in there because it just, uh, it makes navigation and using the app so much easier. Um, yeah, that, that's my personal preference. You can put any size you like there, but that one looks best and works best if you ask me. So yeah, 12.9 for me. Excellent, and from Gideon and also from Kenneth, a uh, similar question is summarizing it. Can you elucidate further on the planning status of the factory? So the timings related to production and what is where are we at at the factory right now? Yeah, so where we are at the moment is we should get a decision in September. We, we, we're waiting. We, we will get all of our documents in this month. So we, we thought we'd got everything in and then we, we now have some additional acoustic trials that uh, need to be completed to, to, to help resolve some of the noise concerns of the environmental health uh, people. Uh, once they're in, um, and they're, they're being carried out by a, a leading UK authority, looks after a lot of the big airports. Uh, so we're, we're very confident in, in what this guy's doing for us. When they go in, uh, as far as we are currently aware, that is everything that they have asked for. So we should go to committee in September. In parallel with that exercise, we're doing the design and build uh, tender. So we're just starting that work at the, the moment. Um, and assuming we execute that, quickly we should be ready to to put a spade in the ground uh by the the end of the year so that still puts us okay. in in time for for production excellent uh gene is asking a question given all the work that is going into manufacturing the doors and streamlining them with the door hinges latches holes etc will we still be able to remove the doors for photo work? yes 
Yeah, the doors have removable yeah. pins. So uh, you can, Josh, <laughs> come with me. Uh, if you see these, these big pockets that we've put here, these pockets essentially take uh, large banana hinges. Uh, and the reason the pockets are so big is so that you can unhook the uh, so you can unhook the banana hinges as you would in in other helicopters that you might be familiar with. So they get covered over to restore the structural integrity of the beam, and then the windscreen's bonded over. But you still have. Can you get in there, Josh? Yeah, you still have that pocket in there to be able to get the the banana hinge in. Uh, and to be able to, to lift it off. It'll be slightly more cumbersome than you, you might have been used to, because as you saw, uh, in fact, I'll go and get it. As you saw, the doors are actually quite big on HX50. Um, big, but not heavy. So it's fairly easy to line it up and, and hook it in as you'd require to. So at the moment, that's just the door skin. It hasn't got any of the, the locking mechanism or the door card or any of that furniture in, but it's still easily, uh, easily uh, handleable. You wouldn't want to do it on a windy day though. No helicopter, you want that. Yeah. So from uh, BK, he says, hello from Botswana. Are the doors removable? We have already addressed that. Mm -hmm. And following up on that, Yes, and does the full blade rotor option um, have any, any effect on the lifespan of the rotor blades compared to the rigid blades? Rigid no, blades not. meaning not foldable. Yeah, no, no, it has no, no effect at all. No, blades are identical. Do you want to elaborate, Jace? Because this is actually a fairly common question that we get. Um, quite a few people have asked it. I think it's a concern for a lot of people that if you have the blade folding kit, there's going to be some form of compromise. So do you want to just give a little description of how that system works um, so that people have a little bit better understanding of that? So for, for people that are familiar with, say, the MD500 and the way the, the, those blades swing, in concept, high level conceptual terms, the blade fold mechanism is quite, quite similar to that. So essentially, we pop out one of the, the pins out of the, the blade uh, root connection and swing the blade on the, the other pin. So uh, it's, it's a very simple thing. Uh, the pins themselves uh, are designed so that they expand to fit in the hole. So there isn't a wear issue with the, the pins either. And the blades have been structurally designed so that they're, they're not harmed by being swung, swung back. Obviously, you're still going to have to show due operational care. If you start clanging blades together and banging them into things, yes, you're, you're going to shorten the life of your, your blades. Uh, but that applies to hangar rash in, in, in any aircraft. But no, I, I don't anticipate any, uh, any diminishing of the, the life of the, the, the blades at all by uh, using the, the blade fold kit. Okay. Philip is asking the question, what is the circular hole, uh, the socket in the footwell between the anti-torque pedals? referring to the air vent uh, down on the oh, floor the, by your feet the, the, what the, the chin window so in in no. that uh, in the in the I'm photos not... we have a sort of a round circle down oh between your feet yeah yeah. Back and feet. yeah that's the air vent that, uh no i think that's uh, an early version of the uh, adjustment for the pedals so i think that was uh, a bit like the uh, the bell method where they've got a, a a, uh, a knob to allow the pedals to move forwards and backwards. It was a that, that's changed slightly uh, now. It doesn't work like that anymore. So yeah, it was there in, in again just going back to the human factors stuff. Um, because unlike a car, where you just turn your steering wheel like that, the cyclic moves forwards, backwards, and side to side. So you have to position the whole human being about the centre point of the cyclic travel. Now, when you take into account the tallest and the smallest. The, the smallest still has to be able to get the cyclic all the way back uh, 150 millimetres. So that then means the pedals have to come towards them for them to be able to, to reach the pedals. So we have to adjust the seat and the pedals to be able to make sure we can accommodate people of all, uh, well, uh, as far as possible, people of all shapes and, and sizes. So yeah, we've, we've, we've done a lot of work on that and lots of things have, have changed there to make sure that we adequately um, make the thing accessible to everybody. Charles Dyke has the next question. He's asking, will every airframe be inspected like this? I think it was the moment that you were describing that airframe. 
I imagine some parts like rotor blades, for example, are much less tolerant to warping. I guarantee that the 44 isn't at the same level of finish. Why so much scrutiny on the fuselage dimensions? Uh, because we, we are developing a process from scratch. And if you think about it, we've got a carbon fiber structure that doesn't thermally expand at all. And then we're putting a metallic drivetrain down the back of it that does expand. And so we need to understand where we are with all of these things so that we don't end up uh, damaging various bits of the drivetrain when we connect the whole thing together. Um, we're also uh, aspiring to a, a sort of automotive level and fit and a fit and finish. And certainly the, the, the sort of surface contours of HX50, if you don't resolve the geometry of the aircraft well enough so that everything fits properly, it'll look like a dog's dinner. If everything on the aircraft looks like a dog's dinner, people will just accept that's, the, the, that's aircraft. But if you have a, a perfectly formed body and then the doors don't fit, or the windows don't fit, or the panel gaps are all over the place, it'll very quickly diminish uh, the perceived quality that we that's important to to us and important to our customers so we're developing processes that are extremely repeatable so that you've got automotive levels of fit and finish I don't think for one minute you'll get all the way there because aircraft structures are inherently more flexible than cars are we can't make them stiff enough uh, to, to deliver all of that but it's going to be really close um, and so yeah we, we're having to control that to make sure that it delivers on what's in the what's in the pictures everywhere so that that's that's one of the the main reasons okay very good uh clint is asking a fun question it says will we, will we be able to see a skidded version of the hx50 at the december global meetup and discover event and then secondary to that um have you decided on any exterior and interior color choices for those uh, first two prototypes no, I think they'll have painted them and trimmed them before I've decided what colour I want them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I expect there to be well, a Well, that's part of the surprise, there. right? It's going to be a surprise, <laughs> yeah. Jason, right? you got to come. you got to come to see, you know. Surprises are like that, right? Why would we be unveiling the colour on that? I don't think so, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm certainly not going to give the colour away. I'm certainly not going to give the colour or trim away. But, yeah, you can expect to see a skidded version there. Right, excellent. And uh, from Charles as well, we have a question about the heli move. What about heli move battery life? Will the heli movement affect the ability to do battery starts? So again, it's a it's a trade off, and we've got a little bit more development work to, to do on this. One of the options that we will probably provide is for a higher capacity uh, battery for people that want a longer range of, of heli move capability um, but if we all draw from the the same battery system then yes the battery has capacity has to be adjusted to take account of heli move i think at the moment the intention is that heli move has a completely independent battery uh, so that it doesn't affect the size of the battery that's critical to uh, the performance of engine starts and your 30 mil, uh, 30 minutes of critical systems uh, in the the event of a generator failure so it'll be a separate battery. It may be possible, I haven't decided yet, it may be possible to have options on how big that battery is for people that have different missions. So trade off the weight uh, against the capability. That would be nice. Um, just a follow up question on that, just because I've been receiving a few emails about that recently. It, uh, do you know what the uh, steepest angle that HeliMove will be able to climb up? So people are asking about if they wanted to put it onto a trailer, um, would they be able to, to get it on a trailer? So. Have you have you done the testing on angles? Uh, no, it's a very simple thing for us to do, but we haven't done that. Um, what we were testing on is that the critical case for torque is actually running over really, really loose ground, where essentially it's digging itself out of the ground all the time. Um, and, and in really soft ground where the nose wheel starts to dig in, you're plowing a, a furrow. So those were the cases that, that dominated the, the torque when we did the, the trials on the heli move rig. So it's a, a fairly simple calculation to do to work out what the steepest incline is. Uh, my feeling is that will probably be dominated by the clearance of the tail boom, actually. Um, right. I, think, I think off the top of my head, that's about 15 degrees. So, but I'll, I'll check that. Okay, yeah, that's good. And then uh, the next question is okay. from Steve. 
and uh, he's asking, do you expect to be able to replace the glazings um, for the windshields in the field? Yes. Just like they do on your car. All right, All right that was easy. Uh, before we go to the next question from Steve as well, we have a general request of information from Raymond that I can reply to, which is, what are the export costs to Africa? So the aircraft is sold, uh, if it's an export, it will be VAT excluded. So there's no VAT applicable in the UK. Uh, so there's no tax in the UK, but when you import your aircraft to your specific country, you're gonna have to have a tax advisory to know exactly what is the best way to do that, uh, complying with your tax obligations in your country. So we don't know every single country, what's the different tax systems and different uh, 62 countries being receiving orders from we have actually uh, many clients have commented uh what are the tax situations but we never um, give that information from us as a source because you could possibly be mistaken on that so it's good that you seek that information locally with your tax advisor but again there is no tax applicable uh from the from the uk point of view so only for clients that receive the aircraft in uk then you have the vat on top of the price so the question is from Steve, waiting balance. The could, could I, could I, tank. Go ahead. Ruben, yes, could I just yes, add, yes. add to that? Just, just, to be, just to be very clear, all of our helicopters are delivered X-Works in the, the UK, uh, and then the, the customers will export them, and the, all of those processes are the responsibility of the, the customer. So our, our delivery facility is in, the, is in the UK. Exactly. So Steve has the question of weight and balance, the forward fuel tank leverage, leverage for balancing. Is it still in the plan? How is it going? Yes. Reserve fuel, would it need to be in the main and trim tank, correct? Uh, it's, it's a, all, yes, that, that trim tank is crucial to the whole configuration of HX50. It doesn't work unless you put that, that trim tank there. So the trim tank's really important. It is essentially invisible to the, the pilot. All it's there to do is essentially move the center of gravity. Well, let's demonstrate it, Josh. So the main fuel tank lives between the two bulkheads, rear bulkhead and cabin bulkhead here. That volume is essentially the, the fuel tank. We've got a very big fuel tank and it's a little bit too far back. On top of that, for this weight of aircraft, we've made a helicopter that has a very big cabin. So all of your variables have got longer moment arms than, than they would have in other helicopters. So what we need to do to get all of this to balance is essentially bring that CG of the fuel a little bit further forwards. Now in the very early days when we were developing this, I looked at fuel tanks under the floor, I looked at L-shaped fuel tanks under the floor, I looked at making the helicopter taller, I looked at running a center console all the way through the center. None of it worked because none of the fuel was far enough forward. So we ended up with a, a, a small trim tank in the front that's buried in the instrument console. It's actually entirely external to the, the fuselage. Um, and that is enough to bring the CG just far enough forwards that it trims out the, the weight and balance and gives us a best in class uh, weight and balance range for the aircraft. It's not just the trim tank actually, that's also down to having a, a three bladed uh, main rotor on top. Okay. Uh, Jason, can I ask you just, uh, just a question related to that? It's my curiosity here also. We also received this question repeatedly. If that system fails, what is the consequence? Is it a safety concern, a major safety concern? What happens if that system fails? If, if that system fails, you'll progressively drift towards one of the CG limitations. So if the system fails, you'll get an alert because all the system does is it maintains a known relationship between the amount of fuel in the main tank and the amount of fuel in the trim tank. So if those are incorrect, the control loop will try and fix it. If it can't fix it or it loses the signal or of one or the other, you'll get an alert and there'll be a bunch of procedures in the pilot operating handbook that tell you what to do. Each aircraft comes with an isolator valve and a drain valve to deal with the trim tank. So you can always deal with the worst case of fuel getting stuck in the trim tank and you increasingly becoming more nose down. So the, in the worst situation, you're gonna have a finite amount of time uh, to put the aircraft back on the ground, which if you're flying under 
normal VFR conditions, that's not going to be a problem. Okay. Good. And, and then, so the, I should also say, the digi cockpit will tell you exactly what to do. You won't have to think about it. <clears throat> that's helpful. Charles is asking, any word on the expanding maintenance training program outside of the factory? Uh, I don't understand the question. So the so uh, being able to train engineers. So having, yeah. uh, I think, field locations around the world of having engineers getting trained to have the maintenance type course is the question. Do you have any uh, plans for that? I haven't got any plans for it at the moment, but again, I'm, I'm very open minded. Uh, I, I don't I don't at the moment think we need to, to control everything. I think uh, if it makes sense to do that operational, uh, if it makes operational sense to do that, we'll do that at the, at the time. At the moment, it is only possible to do everything centrally. Uh, once we've got more capable people out there in the field and we start to build trust with them, we can start to delegate a little bit more uh, responsibility out to them. Fantastic. Before we go to a news question, uh, we have also another general question we can answer. From Yuri, he says, uh, what is the time delivery to Miami, Florida? So as Jason has referred to, the aircraft is FOB at the factory. So all the aircrafts are delivered at the factory. Then it is the owner's responsibility to engage with a logistic, uh, logistics provider to take the helicopter to your final destination or to fly it. That's a lot of fun. But if, it's not if, that, if that is not practical for you, then you'll be uh, um, engaging with one of the major providers. We actually have done that. Tamish and I have already talked with, um, I believe is, I uh, can't say the name, but probably at the top uh, one, two or three of the world. They're specialized on transporting uh, helicopters. They do more than 500 a year. And they, give us a, they have already given us a ballpark of cost estimates. So from the last, actually, if it was today, uh, that uh, 44 container to take it from the UK to Florida will be around eight to $10,000. Okay, so that's the reference price that we have today. We have several of these prices that were asked for a quotation, uh, but it will be uh, obviously changing in the future. But we're gonna have um, certain companies that we can refer to if you want to engage with them. And they will be able to provide you a you know, white glove service of taking the helicopter. They're specialized on that from the factory to final destination. Next question is from Neil is, can you briefly describe the completion status of the HS-50? So when the owner engineer arrives to assist with the completion of the flight test status. I think there's a, mis a misunderstanding here because he's talking about you know, owner's engineer and probably he's referring also to owner's responsibility to complete the, 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 the build, right? So can you clarify those two, two things very well? The owner's uh, involvement at the end and then who does the flight testing and possibly the flight testing at the factory and also flight testing at the final destination. So uh, in terms of the, the build school process, um, the, there are some FAA standards that get adopted fairly broadly around the world that define which parts of uh, an amateur built aircraft you have, to, you have to build. And so things like engines, transmissions, rotor systems, uh, avionics, obviously you're not expected to manufacture those your, yourself. But things like the, the airframe, the larger assembly tasks, uh, the flight controls, things like that, you are expected to, to be involved in the build process. Um, but what we've done is we've made all of that as simple to do as possible. If you take our flight controls, for example, we use the, uh, the modern push-pull tubes that run from the center console around the nose and then onto the main rotor transmission at the top of the fuselage. So they're very, very simple to install. The composite fuselage has been designed to accept those very simply as well. Uh, if, you, if you look at the way that we produce our composite fuselages, then yes, you're going to be involved in laminating, you're going to be involved in, in bagging and producing your, your fuselage, but as part of a very, very, very tightly prescribed manufacturing process with all the tools and the equipment there that you need to be able to do it and under close supervision uh, of our own engineers to make sure that every little detail is done correctly and signed off properly to the approved standard that the test articles were, were made and tested to. So irrespective of your, your level of capability, the process will walk you through it and it will be uh, uh, attainable by, uh, by anybody irrespective of their, their, their background. If they're capable of flying a helicopter, they'll be capable uh, of coming and partaking in the, uh, the build school. 
And then in terms of the, the flight testing, once the, the machine is constructed, it'll go through our quality control uh, processes and then it will be our pilots that do the initial shakedown testing uh, to allow it to be awarded its uh, um, airworthiness certificate here in or permit. Uh, here in the, the UK and then once it's disassembled for, for shipping it's then the, the responsibility of the, the owner to arrange the, uh, the flight testing when it gets back to their, their locality but that again is likely to be carried out through the maintenance facility that will uh, come to maintain the, the aircraft in the field and the intention is that that, that maintenance engineer will be at the factory at a same or similar time to receive his training and so he'll be fully trained as to how to support that process uh, when it gets back uh, to each territory. Great. Next question is Stephen. He's saying, I had a chance to see a Tesla midnight red color recently in Europe. I was a spot. I expect to see a little to have a cinematic color. Can you hear that? Sorry, sorry, Misha, um, you broke up there. He has a, a He's greater than the mic, Misha. So, can you just test one more time? Otherwise, I can read the question because there's a problem with your audio. Can you guys, there. can you repeat that once more? Can you hear me okay now, or am I breaking up? No, you're breaking up. No, it's could breaking you, up. Could you read that there's one? There's a problem with the audio here. So, I had a chance to see the new Tesla Midnight Cherry Red Color in Europe a month ago. Uh, it's astonishing. Would you expect the Hill Red to have similar dramatic depth of color? I haven't seen it, but yes, of course I do. <laughs> you, know, you know what? When, when, Steve, when I read this, uh, this, uh, this question from Steve, I Google it, and it looks really nice. It's a, quite a nice uh, cherry color, as he says. It's very attractive. Uh, but what we say, Jason, is that pretty much, you know, you can paint your helicopter as you want, right? Yeah, uh, modern, modern uh, paint systems uh, are really, really, really uh, clever and you can color match pretty much anything that you want to these these days so we have a, a set of base colors but there's options for you to paint the helicopter however you want to so the, the simple answer is yes if it's technically possible to do it we'll do it for you there you go Misha try the next one otherwise I'll pick it up go again Misha okay sounds good um so the next theory for carbonate windows are they uh, scratch resistant you guys so, hear me okay now? Uh, it's better, but I think I got the just a little question. Uh, let's see. Okay. So uh, polycarbonate windows are nowhere near as scratch resistant as acrylic. That's why people used acrylic for, for decades. Um, what we have to do is coat the polycarbonate with a, a hard coating that makes the surface more resistant to, to scratches. Um, technically, some of these, these coatings uh, can deliver uh, improved hardness over standard acrylic but of course they're very thin and they, they're, they're prone to damage over time and of course if you do scratch it you can't polish it in the way that you can polish acrylic so unfortunately this is one of the areas where nothing in life is for free and uh, the trade-off here is um, we have to live with a, a windshield that scratches a bit more readily than acrylic does in order to avoid a bird in the face um, and, and that's that's just the physics of it unfortunately so the, the only options we have unless you were going to try and go down the route of laminating polycarbon acrylic but that's really messy so I, I think um, the polycarbonate screens should be good for at least 10 years if you look after them properly but like anything else if you abuse it you'll end up replacing it um, sooner but the good news is that we make them and so they're inexpensive the label, right. the, the label will cost you more than the windscreen. <laughs> oh, that's a good pitch. Uh, with Hill, the label will cost more than the screen itself. All right, so Kevin is asking, are the latest rollerblade designs, well, the latest rollerblade designs, are they being designed in a way that reduces the acoustic signature, similar to the, the, the way it is being done with the H160 to 160? So we haven't gone that far, no. That, that's not the right thing for a company like us to do at this moment. The, firstly, the, the technology in those blue edge rotors is patented, uh, patented extremely tightly, so we, we can't go anywhere near that. Uh, and secondly, uh, the guys at Airbus and at Honorat 
uh, that have been working on that technology have been doing that for decades and nothing else. It is very, very, very sophisticated uh, stuff. So it's, it doesn't make sense with everything else that we've got going on to, to chase those, those improvements just at the moment. Our, our technology is a generation behind that. Um, it's low tip speeds, it's got a parabolic tip, it's got a very quiet ducted fan. Um, and so we expect a, a similar noise signature to the, the EC120, which is a very quiet helicopter. The other thing that we've done is we're going around the rest of the aircraft and making sure all of the other sources of noise are kept in, tra in train too. So inlet silencing, we'll do what we can with the exhaust silencing and directionality. We'll make sure that none of the panels drum skin like they tend to on traditional helicopters to get the overall noise down as well as the, the rotor noise. So HX50 will be a quiet uh, helicopter, um, but I think the H60, uh, the H160 will be a little bit better for a, a little while yet. You know what, Jason? The good news is that, you know, Hill has just started, right? So it, <laughs> there's plenty of time ahead. Yeah. So expect many, many good things coming yeah. over. And I've got, uh, I've got, I've got, I've got have something have realized to by now. I've got to have something exactly. to sell next week. So people have realized, <laughs> absolutely. So people have actually realized by now that Hill is here to stay. So it's not going to be here to stay for this model, for the HS50 and HC50. You know, there's many things coming, right, in the future 10, 20 years. So expect development and you can't just do everything you can see around us in the, what has so, been accomplished has been tremendous. But again, a little bit of an overview of that future so people can have that idea that this is not stopping here in this helicopter, right? Just... Yeah, I mean, let me let me just add one thing to that, just to, to plant a little a little seed of curiosity, which is, um, I I was trained um, uh, in helicopter aerodynamics, so my PhD is in computational helicopter aerodynamics. So the bit that's most interesting to me in for in in helicopters overall is the rotor system is the rotor system aerodynamics and structural dynamics and acoustics and there was no the, there would be nothing uh, i would rather do than push the envelope of what you can do um with with helicopter rotor technology full stop and there's a whole bunch of things that i'm really interested to try but they all take a long time and they all cost a stack of money and so we will do a load of things in that area but the most important thing that we've got to do first is industrialize so we've got a platform to, to build on so am i interested in fast helicopters yes am i fast interested in quiet helicopters very much yes because that's going to become a problem very quickly am i interested in lots of other things that we can do with helicopters yes but we've got to industrialize it first we've got to get these machines out into service get the industry making money and washing its own face and once we've done that then we can start thinking about technology development and more blue skies okay very good um steve is asking the question this is a really good question uh, you had the caa team on site last week are you maintaining a distribution of these types of updates to your certification partners such as the T uh, transport canada faa casa etc uh, to facilitate concurrent approvals uh we haven't uh we haven't yet no this this sort of thing has been offered to the the uk caa um and they 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 said that they hadn't been following these sorts of updates they're much more interested in the procedural stuff because all of the regulators are extremely busy they're very under resourced uh, and to engage with you they just need you to jump through the procedural steps so it seems like a good idea but there, there isn't a massive appetite for it they need you just to jump through the hoop so they can do their job so the reason we pulled them back in uh, at this point is because we now need to do that and we need, now need to be a bit closer to them than we have been to, to date um, and so we've got we've got to sign up for a few of the additional approvals and get those things moving because we've got the the information and the maturity now to to do that. Charlie is asking about any update on the rotor system, main rotor, third rotor, and uh, the hub. 
yeah, there's loads of work going on that going on with that at the, the moment. So um, I gave the, the, the core customers a, an update on, on the app on that a little while ago. So Craig's been working extensively on the, the main rotor hub uh, and on the, the packaging of the flight controls uh, and on the detailed design of the strap packs that we use to retain the, the blades onto the, the main rotor hub. Uh, we have got a, uh, an early prototype strap pack lying around somewhere. Um, but, but yes, we've, uh, so, so there's a lot of work going on on that. We've also been doing a lot of work in terms of the composite blade uh, design for manufacture. So there's some very standard recipes that you, you use for how you make a composite rotor blade. It's a very well understood art. Uh, and so we've been putting those pieces together with some of our, our colleagues so that we've got all of the elements that we need ready to be able to produce the first set of uh, rotor blades. The, the only thing that's missing there at the moment is there's still some contention about how we do the erosion shields, uh, whether, we can, whether we can press those or whether we need to electroless plate or, or produce those in, a, in, another, in another way. So once that's done, uh, we'll be essentially ready to produce the first set of, set of rotor blades. Exciting stuff. Charles asking a question, what's the deal with the air conditioning? Is it going to be an off the shelf system or are you going to build that too? <laughs> no, I, I, we're, we're hoping to be able to get enough of the components off the shelf because uh, it, it, if you can buy them right, it shouldn't be expensive. Um, but we'll be putting the system together. So the way these things work is there's people that provide various elements that you bring those together to make a system. So the system will be, be ours, but the parts will be from standard providers. Okay, so before Jordi's question, a general comment to uh, one as well, and is when will the first one be ready for purchase? So there could be also this in the study here. So the purchase, uh, the pre-order program has been open now for two and a half years. So to purchase now means that you'll be getting a very good, a decent uh, serial number, exactly serial number 704. But the first one to be delivered, that's different. It would be serial number one, and that is estimated end of 2024, beginning of 2025. So if you order now, the earliest for ready to purchase will be about this time of the year in 2026 for the serial number 704. Now the question for jo from Joris is total times and times for overall. Uh, so the, the aircraft has a nose to tail uh, 5,000 hour life uh, in, in terms of flight time and it's on condition in terms of calendar with it being a very modern composite airframe. Your main maintenance schedule is on 100 hour cycles. So 100 hours or annually, whichever occurs first. And then as you go through 200 hours, 300 hours, 400 hours, there's occasional uh, other bits and pieces that will add to those recurring 100 hours as required. Excellent. Um, we're just getting down to the last few minutes and we've got a few questions left here so we're going to try and pound through them. Gonzalo is asking rest protection for humid near the ocean tropical environments. Uh, yes it's absolutely state of the the art so it's uh, it, it essentially we we've got customers all over the world so all of the the metallic components uh, components receive military grade uh, corrosion protection. Obviously the, the composite structure and composite rotor blades uh, are inherently resilient to that. They've all been designed taking hot, wet, degraded material properties into, into account. Um, and then the, the only other thing that we'll do is we'll provide some uh, guidance in terms of compressor wash and ways to protect the machine if it's not being used very much and you need, it needs inhibiting. So all of the usual things. Like any machine, uh, it needs to be used regularly. If you don't use it regularly, it'll need some protection. Um, but uh, yeah, you can expect it to be extremely resilient to corrosion. That's not something that's been overlooked. Next question is from Carl. Hi, Carl. Great to have you today. So the question is, why such a big and heavy brake rotor for the undercarriage wheels? Uh, because it was very heavy. Yeah, very you have. Yeah, so there's there's two things here. So if you if you're designing a brake disc, you have to be able to dissipate. Uh, a large amount of, of energy. Now in the, the sports car world, I, I think I know where Carl's going with this, they use carbon, ceramic and all these sorts of things. Um, I think Allied Signal still own, own all the IP and still do the majority of the manufacturing for that. 
So I strongly suspect that that would become very, very expensive for an aerospace application, um, in which case we've just stuck with conventional inexpensive steel, uh, steel discs. But in that case, you have to have the mass there to be able to, to get rid of the heat. The other thing that you have to bear in mind is our wheels retract under our fuel tank. So we can't allow the temperature in the discs to build up excessively. Otherwise, if you were doing practice auto rotations with brake stops at the end of it, and then going off and doing another one and then another one, you could find yourself in a situation where you were putting some very hot brake discs back into the wheel wells under the fuel tank. Now, obviously there's heat shields and things in there but it's a, it's a trade-off between cost, performance, reliability, and of course, uh, corrosion, because these brake discs can be sat there uh, out in the open, not in the open, but sat there on the ground uh, for far more hours than the brake discs on your, your cars would be. So yeah, we've tried, we've tried to keep it simple with that, but fundamentally, a brake disc is there to get hot. It's there to have enough mass and enough uh, specific heat capacity to consume all of the kinetic energy that you need to dissipate when you slow down. Um, and we're trying to give ourselves the ability to slow down from the highest possible speed on the, the runway following tail rotor failure or uh, uh, a poorly executed run on auto rotation. Good. Charles is asking, what's the maximum crosswind that, you can, that you've designed the helicopter to hover in? 35 knots in any direction at 10,000 feet on an ISA plus 15 day. It'll do a little bit more than that. That was clear to the point. And Gary's asking, could the final weight of the finish HX allow the heli to bounce around on a windy day? Related uh, kind of turbulence, <coughs> bouncing around. So, we don't want to be bounced around. So, mm -hmm. so there's, two, there's two things there when we talk about bouncing around. The, the first thing is to do with the, the rotor, rotor loading and rotor dynamics. So it's, it's the, the, the blade loading, sorry, the disc loading versus the amount of inertia that you've got in the, the rotor blades that will uh, impact how the rotor feels and responds to gust loading and what have you. In, in that case, we have got a relatively light uh, disc loading. Uh, because we want low power in the, the, the hover, nice efficient helicopter. Um, but we've got quite heavy rotor blades, so there's a nice amount of gyroscopic stability there to, to work with. So it'll feel, it'll feel as planted as something like a, a, a Gazelle or a, a 120 in that respect. <coughs> the next thing is when you move away from a two-bladed rotor to a three-bladed rotor, there's an inherent stiffness between the fuselage and the rotor. So when you think of your rotor spinning around as a disc, that behaves a little bit like a gyro in space and wants to stay uh, in the same attitude that it is in space when it experiences perturbations. But if you're, if you're in a two-bladed rotor system, the only thing holding that fuselage in place is, is weight. So if it gets slapped by a gust wind, it, a, a side gust, it will, it will dangle and it will move. When you've got more than two blades and your flapping hinge is offset from the point of rotation, then what you find is there's an inherent uh, stiffness. So it's like having a spring there that wants to hold the fuselage in the same attitude relative to the disc. And it's that uh, spring stiffness, if you like, if we, we talk in Gareth Padfield's terms, that um, will give you that sense of security when you're flying along. Now, it's not going to be the same as flying in a Sea King or a Super Puma or something like that, where they're, they're big, heavy rotors, uh, they're big, heavy machines, and they've got a relatively small side area compared to their weight. Our helicopter is relatively big against its gross weight, and it has a relatively light disc loading. So it still will move around um, a little, but it'll feel a lot more planted than any of the, the two bladed machines out there. So, you know, unless you're flying in conditions that you shouldn't be, it'll feel pretty secure, but nothing's gonna stop you feeling bumps on a windy day, you know? My flight back from uh, Palmer yesterday was, was bounced around and that was an 80 ton airliner. Okay, Pal's asking, we're just gonna do a couple more questions here um, just to, to try and finish these off. So Pal is asking, what about fire suppression on the fuselage? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so the, the engine bay at the moment is fully, uh, or is 
is, is being designed to be fully insulated in line with all of the requirements for the firewall. And then there are some very modern composite materials that you can use to contain that fire risk. Um, outside of, uh, of that area, we comply completely with the, the requirements in terms of fire retardancy and materials used. Um, but we haven't done anything special beyond that. So you'll still have the, uh, the sort of five minute altitude limit. So being within five minutes of the, the ground so you can get back on the ground uh, fast enough in the event of a, a cockpit fire or a, a serious fire in the, the aircraft. Again, there's only so much you can do before it starts to really hurt your, your performance and your, your pay, payload. Charles is asking about the two and four axis autopilot. How is it coming along? Still on track for availability for serial number number one? Yes. So the, the algorithms are being finalized right now. So the, the two axis algorithms are, uh, will, will be completed first. The four axis is in some respects um, not as much work because we've already got the groundwork of the, the two axis system to, to add to. So yes, they'll, they'll absolutely be available for, for serial number one. Good. And Steve is asking a question about the weight and balance in the digi cockpit. Can you save passenger weights by their name, uh, like you would have a Bluetooth membrane in the car? Um, there's no plan to do that at the moment. At the moment, we're, we're going through and being fairly brutal in terms of what functionality we want within the digi cockpit and what bit we, we leave out on the app and what bit we leave to your navigation app. Because if you're not careful, we could spend a lot of time developing functionality that's no better than what's already out there. And it's development for the sake of development. So um, that, that's one of the areas that we're, we're looking at because unless you actually take sensor feeds off the, the undercarriage, there isn't a great deal of value of having it built into the aircraft beyond having it on your, your EFB or your, your app. And your, your flight planning is when you do your, your center of gravity, not when you sat in the, the aircraft anyway. Um, so yeah, th th those areas are in a state of flux at the moment in terms of which bits we put in which part of the platform. Jonathan, will it be possible to remotely access the onboard camera views while the helicopter is parked via the app? <laughs> well, it's technically possible. We haven't planned to do that uh, at the moment. Um, for, I think for that just limits that, right? It's very easy, right? It's a connection well, to I've, the cameras, right? So, yeah, te technically it's possible, but you've got to think about what you want to do. At the moment, we've got a master battery switch that turns everything off. Uh, and you've got to be in mm -hmm. an area where you can either get a 5G connection um, we're starting right. to we're starting to explore some other options for for data at the moment, but I think you know be be reasonable. We've we've got a lot to a lot to do, and we need to stick to minimum viable at the at the moment. So if there isn't a plan for that. I don't think it's I, I I think it's not a bad idea. There's no reason why we why we wouldn't when the time is right to put the resources onto it and when the infrastructure is right to be able to get the data up and down at a useful speed. At the moment, the data It's a software, is. right? So we'll have development, right? Software, just future developments yeah. and updates. Yeah, 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 yeah. For the future. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because plus the, practi plus the practicality. Piece, sure. Plus the practicalities of yeah. do you want to leave your helicopter on all the time? You know, yes. or do we have a separate circuit yes. that you then flatten the battery? And it's just practical things like that that you care about more in a machine that you leave for longer periods of time. Okay, Ivar is asking, uh, how do you attach your aft turbine shaft to the LPT disc? Are you using a central tie bolt through the disc? Yes. So, curvic coupling, central tie bolt. All right. All right. And Daymar is asking about, uh, as your team is working on the digital cockpit, do you plan on making interface with third-party hardware possible? such as imaging or camera pods? Uh, yes, we certainly will. So uh, cameras is a big thing for both private helicopter pilots and commercial helicopter pilots. So yes, we'll absolutely make uh, that, that, that second screen that we've got on the co-pilot side is perfect real estate for proper integration of that sort of stuff. So we'd be more than happy to do that. Um, we, can open, uh, we can open dialogue as soon as people want to. Um, but again, we've got a, a finite capacity within the software team at the moment to get a lot of key stuff done. So it will likely follow a little 
down the road as a as a, a, a an, an update that can be done. Okay. Excellent. Um, so we are just a little bit over time, and we uh, we'd like to end on time here. So we're just going to end with one final question, and um, then we're going to close it off. So I just want to say, uh, first of all, Jason, thank you again for taking your time. Um, I know that these uh, updates are a lot of work to be able to bring everything together and present it all with the the photo and imagery that we have. So thanks again for taking that time, and uh, we look forward to the next update, which is going to be coming very soon. And um, so the the last question here is going to be um, just about giving a, an update again. This was a re repeat of before, but just to clarify, the year of 2025, if we start production, let's say in the beginning of 2025, how many helicopters do you plan to produce in that year? Just so people have an, a bit of an idea if what the serial number they're on, what when should they expect delivery of their aircraft? So as it stands at the moment, we should be able to produce uh, 500 helicopters in that, 475 helicopters, I think, within within that calendar year by the time we've ramped up but the following year the production rate will essentially be 675 because of the the volume run rate that we're producing so if anybody drops slightly into the next year they'll be caught up very quickly okay. actually just a comment that's excellent news Misha so if you want your helicopter how helicopter by 2026 put that order in because you're going to be there for 2026 with this capacity of production after that a little bit more good thank you again jason and uh, thanks everybody for attending we had well over 2,000 people connecting here again today uh, from all over the world it's really wonderful to have you and we look forward to having you next time thanks a lot guys thank you for your attention and for your questions